I wanted to ask just, uh, just relatively quickly here, because Mr. Yablonski, you, you um, in your testimony, referred to uh, kind of an alternative to the mandatory funding piece um, in terms of a proposal to, to use user fees as a potential offset following the, the, the Pittman-Roberts um, fund that has been successfully implemented for decades. And uh, it's something that I've, I've thrown out there in different conversations just to try to tr test the temperature, if you will. Um, you've actually released a report, How We Pay to Play, which examines the implementation. So uh, let, me, let me start with you first and uh, ask for your suggestions or your thoughts as to how Congress, if we were to implement this type of a, a user fee to support recreation funding, how do, how do you suggest that that is structured? And then as he is, is responding to that, um, Mr. Omar, I, I'm going to ask you to weigh in here, give your, uh, give your views on, on this as, as something for us to consider. Right. right. Well, uh, Madam Chair, as you know, I mean, this is an enormous opportunity to bring an additional source of revenue to the table for, for all the conservation needs that we've been talking about here today. Uh, sportsmen, as our report uh, laid out, uh, through uh, hunting and fishing licenses brings in about $1.6 billion a year and excise taxes on gear and equipment related to hunting and fishing brings in an additional $1.1 billion a year for wildlife conservation. So you put those two uh, together, you have $2.7 billion going to states for wildlife conservation. Essentially, sportsmen are underwriting uh, the majority of uh, wildlife conservation in America today, and you compare that number to the 400 uh, plus million with LWCF, and you see that there's this, there's this potential if you could look at the market and where it's growing, and we keep hearing here today about outdoor recreation, and this is sort of the, sh you know, the shifting sands of, of uh, preferences and demographics, but an $887 billion uh, economic output, if you were to tap one-tenth of one percent of that, you would fully fund LWCF at the levels that everybody's seeking forever and ever. Um, so one, you know, opportunity here is to look to the outdoor recreationists, pe people like me. I'm a, I, I go hunting, and for every ten times I go hunting, uh, nine of those times I'm a hiker. Maybe only one time I'm, you know, I'm a bad hunter, so uh, maybe one time out of ten I, I'm actually a hunter. Um, but I don't pay anything as a hiker for the impacts I have to trailheads and to the, the uh, trails that I'm actually hiking on. So um, I think um, part of this needs to be a bottoms-up thing. I think with the hunting and angling community in the 1930s and 1950s, they bought into this. There was an ownership interest in conservation, and they wanted this kind of uh, license, and they wanted the excise tax, and they guard it jealously. And I really think it's incumbent on the outdoor recreation community to sort of have this groundswell and figure out how they can sort of, what I would call BYOL, bring your own life raft, and actually uh, be a part of the solution here where you have a, an ownership interest uh, in conservation funding going forward. Mr. Omar, your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, and I'm, I'm hesitant to disagree with my good friend Brian, <laughs> but um, the American people have already paid in some way, right? I know it doesn't score well, it doesn't kind of meet like kind of the CBO, um, kind of the way we think about scoring, um, but the, the deal that was cut in 1964 was this idea that we're going to be having to liquidate additional public resources in the form of offshore oil and gas to meet the growing population at the time, and then therefore those revenues should go towards conservation to basically mitigate the impact. And so I, I get that it doesn't score because it's money that could otherwise go to Treasury, but in some ways they already have paid through the degradation of our public resources. I mean, and look, and, and as someone who was in my, my organization helped kind of write Pittman Robertson in 1937, um, it has been incredibly successful. We've done a wonderful job bringing back white-tailed deer and elk and mule deer and pronghorn um, and a whole range of sportfish and wild turkeys and, 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 and a whole range of waterfowl. Um, we've also done a pretty bad job with everything we don't hunt and fish. 
And one of the challenges we face right now is a lot of the species that are in trouble, you can create a moral hazard in the design of these programs. Because in that case, because the funding came from sportsmen, they rightfully, including myself, wanted the, the conservation of game species. And so we didn't see a lot of work on kind of other areas. And so we would love to work with you on, on trying to figure out ways to fund all these things. I do think we hold a conservation to a higher bar than we do other parts of funding in the budget. I mean, when you see places that we've waived paygo, you see places where, you know, supplementals or, or OCO or things like that, we tend not to hold conservation to the same standard we tend to hold to a higher bar um, but this is a tough you know it's a tough conversation but I, I do think that you know taxing backpacks and things like that probably isn't the right way to go if we're going to try to have a per permanent sustained funding model we should be able to find a couple billion dollars in a multi-trillion dollar budget for conservation that supports an 887 billion dollar economy